afternoon, everyone. Uh, good uh, morning uh, and also good evening, depending on when you are watching this. Uh, if you're watching this live here on January 28th, uh, good afternoon. My name is Thaddeus. I am a planetarium educator here at the Bell Museum, and I am happy to be back with our monthly Minnesota Night Skies, uh, where we're going to explore what is up in our January sky, January 2022, uh, first month of the new year, and a lot of very cool things in the sky. Um, I am doing this uh, via Zoom, so the Zoom is going to the Facebook here, um, and so our interaction today is going to be through the comment box uh, in, on Facebook. If you have any comments, questions, things you're wondering about, things you'd like to let me know about as we go along, please feel free to put those in the comment box there on the Facebook video. Um, I am happy to answer as many questions as I can uh, today as we go along, uh, and, uh, and yeah, let's, uh, let's get started. So uh, for those who have joined me before in this, uh, you have some idea what's gonna happen here. Uh, I'm gonna be using uh, the program called Stellarium uh, to investigate our night sky and show you some very cool things up there. Uh, Stellarium is a free open source program. Uh, it is available to anyone, uh, anywhere. Uh, it is available for a computer like I'm using today, a laptop. Uh, it is also, there's an app available on phones as well, uh, Stellarium. We'll show you the night sky, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of things in the night sky uh, from anywhere in the world at pretty much any point in time going back uh, several thousand years. Uh, and today, as we start out, uh, I have it set up for uh, January, um, and we're actually starting here on January 3rd. Um, and actually, you know, before I even get into that, uh, I need to make sure, I've got a notes, some notes here. Uh, first thing though that I need to mention, uh, in the sky, currently moving away from us, the James Webb Space Telescope successfully launched uh, three days ago, Christmas morning, uh, at 7.20 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, beautiful launch, uh, an amazing telescope. It is headed away from the Earth out is about 25% of the way out or so uh, to its final resting point, uh, a million miles away from the Earth at Lagrange Point 2. Uh, and it's just incredibly exciting. This is, uh, this is just incredibly exciting for astronomers across the world. Um, it, it's, a, it's an amazing telescope. It is the next generation of telescopes in space. Uh, it is going to reveal a, more than I could possibly talk about in 30 minutes. Um, and I'm not even going to try in, uh, in 30 seconds here. Um, what I will say is that there is a fantastic site to track where the James Webb is. Um, we'll put that link there in the Facebook uh, comments chat. Um, so you can click on that and check out what James Webb is up to. Uh, it tracks its distance from the Earth, um, some uh, basic parameters, as well as, the, as well as its deployment sequence. Um, so it is a, it is a telescope uh, that is, in fact, folded up inside a rocket and unfolding this telescope, getting it to its final point, uh, involves a series of about 300 different steps. Um, and some of the major ones are listed on that James Webb Space Telescope website. Uh, one amazing thing about James Webb here, uh, since we are exploring our January sky, is that by the end of January, James Webb should be should be in its final position uh, at this L2 Lagrange point two uh, position, a uh, million miles away from the Earth. Um, th that's the plan, at least. Um, fingers crossed that everything continues to go uh, smoothly uh, as it as has already gone uh, once it got up into space there. All right, so uh, keep your eye on James Webb uh, for in the coming month and months ahead um, as we wait to get back some of the first uh, images from this incredible telescope. All right, um, but I have started out here um, on January 3rd uh, because uh, this is the first, uh, one of the first things I wanna talk about is happening uh, around the first, really the first week of, uh, of January here. Uh, and that would be the Quantrodids meteor shower. Uh, so the first uh, meteor shower that we have during the year, that's a fairly bright one and easy to see. The Quantrodids is peaking on January 3rd. And to see this meteor shower, um, you're gonna get out, you're only gonna get out in the pretty early morning, some, some, sometime between 3 a.m. And, and dawn. Um, and you'll want to look, um, first I, I'd suggest looking uh, in the sky, find out where to look. Um, we start off facing north here, um, but I would start off personally by looking for the Big Dipper, which we can see high above us in the sky here, part of the constellation of Ursa Major or the larger bear. The Big Dipper uh, points us to the North Star or Polaris, which is right over here. 
So these two stars in the end of the bucket of the dipper point us down there. And uh, there we can see Polaris or the end of the Little Dipper. Uh, that is our, as well, our North Star. So Polaris is always directly above the North Pole of the Earth. Um, that'll or help orient you in the sky. Um, looking over here though, uh, from the handle of the Big Dipper, if we go back to the handle of the, the Dipper here, uh, the Dipper here, uh, this will point us downwards to this bright star over here called Arcturus. Um, and this is part of the constellation of Bootes that we see is already marked out there. Uh, but so there's Arcturus and Bootes. And bring that back up. Uh, Bootes is a herdsman or a farmer, um, if you can imagine that there in the night sky. Uh, personally, to me, he always looks a little bit more like a uh, ice cream cone or possibly like a necktie in the sky. And whether it is the top of the ice cream cone or the bottom of the necktie, either way, these three stars here point roughly to the origin, uh, the radiant of the Quantrid's meteor shower. So this is the point in space where the meteors that we see, the little bits of rock and dust, uh, will start entering the atmosphere of the Earth and start uh, heating up the air around them, putting on those, those beautiful, uh, making those beautiful shooting stars that we see in the sky. Now that's where those meteors enter the atmosphere. To really see the Quantrid's meteor shower, to see these meteors, you actually want to face away from that. You're going to want to put you back to this part of the sky. So they'll be coming, in fact, behind your head. And as they do that, as they streak above your head at about 40 miles per second, uh, they will start heating up and you'll see them uh, in the sky above you. So put your back to the uh, east northeast, put your back to the northeast. Um, look, that is then to the southwest and look up for this very cool meteor shower. The Quantrids is a somewhat variable meteor shower. Um, the estimates for how many meteors you might see uh, per hour range from anywhere from about 60 to 100. Um, so there's a bit of range there. Uh, it depends a lot on uh, where we are hitting the stream of the, of the meteor shower, where we're hitting this path of rocks and debris left behind, and also on local viewing conditions, by which I mean, how much light do you have around you? And is it snowing on you? Right now, for example, looking out the window there, uh, I would not expect to see any meteors at all. Of course, it's also daytime, so that's one other problem. Uh, you do want to look at night for meteors. All right, now, if you are looking in the sky as well, January 3rd, um, if you stay up from the, say, we're looking here at 4 o'clock, but if you go even a few hours later in the night to about 6.15, uh, there is another something you can see in the sky. Now, to see this particular object, uh, we are going to look in roughly the same, or actually, no, a little bit different direction. We're going to look over to the northwest, and uh, there's a lot of bright stars over here. Um, to help orient ourselves, let me actually bring back our uh, Little Dipper there, and there's also our Big Dipper as well, part of Ursa Major. Um, now, looking a bit to the left of the Little Dipper, that would be the northwest here if we're facing north. Uh, looking down to the horizon, there's uh, a very bright star over here called Auriga, or something called Capella, which is part of the constellation of Auriga, the charioteer. Um, looking down near the horizon as well, coming back more to the north, there's a bright W of stars that makes up the constellation of Cassiopeia. Very bright, very distinctive constellation in the sky. Uh, very easy to see as well. One issue with seeing Cassiopeia here in the early morning on January 3rd is that uh, it is uh, kind of close to the horizon, so if you have trees and buildings, really tall buildings, that might block your view. But for those watching closely, uh, you may have just seen this bright point of light pop into the sky there. Uh, that bright point of light right here flying above our heads January 3rd in the early morning is the International Space Station. All right, so we have a fantastic sighting uh, January 3rd in the morning. It's about a four-minute pass overhead from about 6.16 to 6.20. Uh, it'll appear in the ISS, will appear there in the Northwest, uh, near sort of in between the Big Dipper, or, or sort of near the Big Dipper and Little Dipper. It'll go above us to uh, pass the constellation of Draco, the dragon, uh, traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. It will move very quickly across the sky, and it will be a very bright, pretty steady point of light. Um, it, it's pretty hard to miss the ISS. Once you spot it in the sky, 
may not look quite as bright as you see it on your screen here, but it'll still be very distinctive in the sky. And the constellation of Draco is not the super brightest constellation in the sky, but as we get to about 618, we'll be coming by the constellation of Hercules. Now, Hercules is really easy to see in the sky because to find him, you just look for four stars, the ones right here, that make up kind of this dented square, um, what we call the keystone of Hercules. And the keystone of Hercules, there are four bright stars that combine with several others um, to make up that full, uh, larger constellation of uh, one of the many heroes in Greek mythology. Now, as uh, the ISS goes by uh, Hercules here, it's also going by a really, one of my absolute favorite deep sky objects. It's gonna make a very quick flyby, as we can see here, uh, time is moving forward just a few seconds, but stopping around 618. Uh, it's gonna make this very close flyby M13, so that it will appear to be close by M13 in the sky. Now, in reality, uh, these two objects are nowhere near each other. The ISS uh, is just about 250 miles above our head, uh, heads. Uh, it was put in space by people. It was built by 17 different nations across the world. It's been up there for over 20 years. It's amazing in its own right. M13, what we see here in front of us, this is a collection of approximately 300,000 stars. It's located about 30,000 light years away from us, um, or maybe about 25,000 light years away from us. Um, it is outside of our Milky Way galaxy, in fact, um, and it is a group of stars that is collectively about 12-ish uh, billion years old. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a little different from the International Space Station is really what I'm trying to get at here. And incredibly beautiful to see. Um, if you have binoculars, this is an object you can pick out as a tiny, tiny little fuzzball. Um, I do recommend uh, if you can get your eyes on a telescope as well, maybe you got one for Christmas. Um, this is a fantastic object to look for in the sky. And again, looking here on uh, January 3rd in the early morning, uh, again, we're here in the very early morning, quarter past six or so, and we're looking now at the constellation of Hercules, uh, looking to the east, northeast or so. Um, Hercules, again, will be very easy to find from those four bright stars. Um, and uh, if you can spot the space station, you can track it along the way. Now, the space station here just has a very quick um, pass by. Um, all things considered four minutes. There are longer passes as well. If you wanna find out when and where you should go out and look for the International Space Station from wherever you are on the earth, uh, there's another link we'll put in the chat there from uh, spotthestation.nasa.gov where you can put in your uh, area, your location on earth, your, your address, your zip code or whatever, and, uh, and find out when the ISS is going over heads. For the first couple weeks here in January, it looks like all the morning passes, or excuse me, all the passes uh, of the ISS are in the morning. So you're gonna wanna get up early, um, or if you're like me, uh, also just wait a couple of weeks until it comes back in the evening sky, whatever floats your boat. Um, also here in the morning sky throughout the month of January, as the ISS slowly makes its way down to the horizon here, um, we have a very bright planet that's come back into our morning sky. Um, so the ISS, as it sinks down there, will be kind of close, relatively speaking, uh, to the red planet Mars. And uh, this is, we saw a satellite fly by there. Uh, this is a fantastic sight to see in the sky. Um, Mars, our red planet, um, one of our close neighbors here, uh, is a fairly popular planet as things go. I'd say I, I do hear a few people um, enjoy looking at it and seeing it in the sky. Uh, it is the only planet entirely inhabited by robots, and the latest robot there, the Perseverance rover, is continuing its work, um, as well as previous rovers like Curiosity and other landers like the InSight lander as well, operating on the red world, uh, helping us learn more about it, and paving the way for future human exploration of the red planet. Uh, it's worth mentioning here, as we look at Mars in the sky, it's visible low to the horizon here to the southeast, and if you're looking for it in the sky, you'll probably spot it here in the morning of the third um, and for the first couple of weeks, you'll spot it near a bright reddish orange star, the one right over here. This star over here is called Antares. And uh, focus a bit on Antares here. Antares is a red star and the name itself relates to Mars because looking at it, it's very easy to confuse the two of them. Uh, for, for each other. They're both reddish, uh, orangey in the sky. Uh, and so that's what people did in the past. Antares uh, means anti-Mars though, anti-Aries or the opposite of Mars. 
um, so that people would know to distinguish the two of them. Today, if you're looking for in the sky or in the morning at least, uh, if you're trying to tell the two apart, um, there's a couple ways to do it. One uh, is that Mars is to the left of Antares. So if you've got two uh, bright red points of light, the one on the left is gonna be Mars at least for, for the time we see here. And also the red, the red star will be twinkling. We can see it pretty clearly there that motion, we'll zoom back in a little bit here, that uh, twinkling motion back and forth like stars do what we call scintillation. Um, that is happening as the starlight is being broken up by our atmosphere. Um, and that is a feature that we see in stars, but we do not really see in planetary light. And that's because the light from planets like Mars here, this is light reflected from the sun. So that light comes through our atmosphere virtually unbroken. Um, and so the planets generally really will not twinkle in the sky, unlike the stars. Now, uh, Antares here is part of a constellation uh, called Scorpius, the scorpion. Um, so just rising up here in the sky, we see the heart of the scorpion and the three claws as well, coming above the horizon. Um, but he is pretty low in the sky um, for reasons that I will get to in a little while here. Um, while we're looking in the morning sky, though, there are a few other things that are visible throughout the month. Uh, over here, in fact, to a bit to the left of Mars is a small comet called 2020P Cope. Not sure I'm getting that name pronounced exactly right. Um, but uh, this small comet is visible in the sky. Uh, you'll need a pretty good telescope to see this one, though. It, it's pretty faint. Um, it is also pretty close to the horizon, at least as comets go. Um, so that, that doesn't help with seeing it. However, um, if you are looking, if you really do want to find some comets in the sky, uh, I do suggest uh, looking uh, earlier in the evening throughout the month. So jumping to 7.30 in the early, uh, so the early evening in the sky and looking to the south, um, we are going to look for the comet, uh, make sure I get its name right, comet 19P Borley. Now, one of the great things about uh, Stellarium here is that it has a search function. So I already have it listed here. 19P just shows up exactly where it is in the sky. Um, so that's a quick and easy way to find out where it is. You know, you've got an app right in front of you. Use the tools you've got. If, of course, you're tracking it down outside in the sky, there's a few other ways you can do that. Um, one uh, is by orienting yourself to the night sky. Uh, Comet uh, Borley here is visible to the southwest, south, southwest as we look at it there. And we already knew how to find one direction in the sky. We knew how to find north. We find north by looking for the Big Dipper and using it to point to Polaris, the North Star, which is always to the north. So with Polaris at our backs, we know we're facing south. And here at 730, then we'd know if we're facing south, Borley is going to be a little bit to our right. We can also triangulate, triangulate a bit here um, because on the morning of the third and for the next few, uh, or the evening of the third, excuse me, and for several weeks all throughout January, looking at 730, there's another bright planet that's visible more to the west southwest, so further to the west there. That would be the planet Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is an amazing planet to look at in its own right. Um, the, the largest planet in our solar system, uh, it has some beautiful, uh, beautiful stripes across its atmosphere where the, the gases are rising and falling. It's an incredibly turbulent planet. Um, with a telescope, you could see things like the Great Red Spot. With bin just binoculars, if you got some of those, um, you can see the four Galilean moons, depending on your clarity, of course. Um, you can see the up to four Galilean moons here. Uh, there is a lot of very cool stuff happening at Jupiter. There's actually a mission going on at Jupiter. Uh, before I forget, um, there's a mission at Jupiter right now called Juno. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Juno actually made a flyby of one of these Galilean moons, I believe it was Ganymede, and uh, it released some very cool data, actually a sonification of the magnetosphere of Jupiter and uh, its interaction with Ganymede. Uh, I think we have a link we'll put in the chat there about that one. If you wanna listen to the sounds of Jupiter from the Juno spacecraft, uh, check that out. But Jupiter here, again, we're actually still hunting down a comet, believe it or not. Um, we are hunting down the comet Borley, and we found now where west-southwest is, and uh, we know where south is. So we've got two directions here, and looking here in the sky, we see that Borley is almost in between those two directions. So we're narrowing down the sky where we're looking here. Um, you may have noticed these constellations, though, again, popping up. Um, constellations like Aquarius are where Jupiter appears nearby these stars of Aquarius. 
And Aquarius has a few bright stars making it up. Um, uh, Alpha Aquarii over here in particular, uh, Satellimilic. Again, I apologize for my horrible pronunciations of star names. Um, that is pretty distinctive and easy to see in the sky. Um, coming up from this uh, one star right here, though, if we come upwards from Jupiter as well, there are four bright stars um, that I'll, I'll draw in again right here, 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 and here. Um, these make up a very simple square in the sky. And in fact, we call it the fall square. We first see it during the fall. Uh, and it makes up the brightest part of the constellation of Pegasus, uh, the winged horse in the sky. And uh, Pegasus here uh, is also fairly bright. The four stars that make it up the square are the easiest to find in my, in my experience. Coming off from Pegasus as well, uh, we have the small constellation of Andromeda. A uh, few stars stand out here in this particular drawing, uh, making up kind of a line with a perpendicular line attached to it. There are some different ways to connect this together. Um, and it coming down from those two, from the constellation Andromeda coming over a bit, we see the moon is over here. That's another way to tell our direction. Um, but we can also draw a line sort of down here. We've got a few bright stars in this region right there. Ooh, some rough drawing right there. Um, this is part of the very small constellation of Aquarius, the ram. Um, Aquarius just has a couple stars in here. We see Alpha and uh, that's your Beta right there. Um, not a very complex grouping, but pre pretty easy to spot. Um, down from these stars, if we continue this line from Andromeda down past Aquarius, we'll come right over here. Um, we've got one star right over there. Um, we'll be able to draw, click on it here, uh, making up the head, uh, the brightest star of uh, Cetus, the sea monster, um, uh, the star, the star Menkar. Uh, now, Menkar defines uh, the head of Cetus here. If you come down from it, there's a few other bright stars that make it up. Um, they aren't exceptionally bright, though, until you get right near the end, Beta Dipti, Dipfi, uh, the end of Cetus, uh, Beta Cedi. Uh, beta Cedi. Um, this makes up the tail of the sea monster here. And so these two stars really mark out where uh, with the beginning and end of Cetus and, and make it the easiest part to find. Again, though, believe it or not, we're still looking for a comet, right? This seems like a long trip to do it, but that's, that's what it sometimes takes in the sky, um, especially with these fainter objects. Going, making this sort of loop around from Jupiter up to Pegasus to Andromeda to Aries, back down to Cetus, those will help you narrow down where you're looking in the sky, because as we come along here, we see right off the tail of Cetus, at least on the morning of the 11th that we're looking at, we see Comet Borley here. And if you've oriented yourself to the night sky, you could look for Borley then on the morning of the 11th, or the evening of the 11th, excuse me. You could also look for it though, as it moves along in the sky. Comets are, in the grand scheme of things, pretty fast movers through the sky. So looking throughout the month, um, and I'll actually jump all the way back to the first, um, or so, um, Borley is down, marked out now just by that, that red marker, it's marked, it's down by beta CD, uh, beta CD. And as it goes along, it'll go past it. And throughout the month, it will start heading up towards, up towards the constellations of Aries and the head of Cetus. So if you can find those two constellations, especially by the end of the month, those will help you narrow it down where to look as well. And there are great star maps as well, finder charts that can help you track down this comet too. Uh, this is a uh, it's also going by the constellation of Pisces, the fish, fishes, which is a, a fainter constellation um, that is popping up here now, but uh, it, it's in, I've had trouble finding that one in the sky, so I didn't jump right to it. Um, taking a little bit closer look at Borley, you will need a telescope to see this comet like most comets that we get in the sky, um, but it is making its closest approach to the sun uh, in, I believe it's about March or so. Uh, May, uh, no, February, February 1st. It's actually making its closest approach to the sun on February 1st. Um, and uh, it'll hopefully then get a little brighter as it does. It'll get a little bit more energy from the sun or a little bit more sunlight will hit the nucleus of the comet, the core of the comet, and that will heat it up, putting off hopefully a little bit more of a tail. I would not expect this one to get as bright as some comets have historically, comets like Neowise a couple years ago or Halley's Comet thinking way back in the past. 
Um, but it should still hopefully be in the reach of amateur astronomers if you've got a telescope. Uh, all right, looking at the sky here, uh, we've come to the end of the month. We'll jump backwards again, still here though at 7.30. And I jumped right back to the fourth because I wanted to mention here as we go through the month, as we go into the first few days of January, particularly January 4th, everyone, happy National World Perihelion Day. I'm waiting for y'all to applaud and cheer over there. Um, all right. <laughs> You're wondering what I'm waiting for. What is perihelion day? Well, January 4th is the day in our or in the Earth's orbit around the sun. It is the day when the Earth is closest to the sun. That is right. We are only going to be about 91 million miles away from the sun on January 4th. I know, right? Right. Um, that is a little different from uh, aphelion day, the furthest point in our orbit in July, when we are about 94-ish million miles away from the sun. So, you know. We got a few million miles difference here, right? That's well, it's pretty big to us humans on a on a planetary scale. It's not that big. Um, our distance from the sun doesn't. We don't really see much of a change in our sky. Um, the one big difference is if you are a if you have a solar filter and you can photograph the sun, um, you'll see that on uh, Aphelion Day and Perihelion Day on the fourth, um, the sun will be a little bit of a different size. So in particular on the perihelion day, we're a little closer. So it'll be appear just a little few percent bigger in the sky. Um, this will show up most obviously though on photographs if you have a camera with the appropriate solar filter. Um, of course, we just passed by another notable day a, few, a week ago, a couple of weeks ago, um, January, uh, December 21st was uh, the solstice, the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. Um, so we have uh, the solstice there a few weeks ago. We have perihelion day coming up. Uh, it's a great time uh, to be celebrating these small moments. Uh, worth noting the solstice and perihelion not really related to each other at all. They happen to fall relatively nearby each other uh, just right now in time. All right. Um, looking through the rest of our sky though, we've got, uh, I think I've got about five minutes to cover the rest of the entire sky. So we'll see how I do here. Um, I've been pointing out a few constellations. I want to point out a few more. Along the way, you may have noticed um, these are some pretty familiar constellations, uh, maybe familiar constellations, whether it's Ursa Major or Ursa Minor, Cassiopeia. Um, these constellations are Greek and Roman constellations um, put together by astronomers like Ptolemy to 4,000 years ago, uh, drawing back, going back to Babylonians, actually Babylonians 4,000 4, years ago. Um, these are very old constellations, but they're not the only set of constellations in the sky. One really great thing about Stellarium is that you can set your constellations and uh, you can also explore uh, some of the different uh, cultures that have looked at the sky as well. Under the star lore settings of, uh, of, of Stellarium, there are about two dozen different uh, constellation groupings um, that you can explore and see different ones. For example, just looking here uh, uh, to the southeast, there are three bright stars in a row right here. But I almost circled, we'll try that again, right there, uh, that make up the, the belt of Orion the Hunter. Um, if you add a few more stars in, like over here and down here, um, along with the belt, uh, you can pick out the full constellation that we recognize as, well, again, Orion the Hunter. Um, but exploring these different uh, cultures, you can see that they see this as different things here in the sky, as different objects, different people. Um, the Ojibwe seeing uh, the winter maker in the sky. The Maya, we'll see if we uh, can bring it out here, seeing a group of both the turtle and uh, the first fire, the primordial fire in the sky, which I'll get to in a second as well. Um, and, and so many more. Even just what we consider Western constellations can be drawn in a variety of different ways whether it's looking for Orion like this, or whether uh, a slightly newer drawing uh, from H.A. Ray. Um, if, you, if you know H.A. Ray, um, who did Curious George, um, he also wrote a book, um, uh, The Stars and Seeing the Stars. Uh, and it's, it's a fantastic way to, to learn the night sky. It's the way I grew up doing it. So I, I, like, I like to mention it. Um, and I wanna make sure we get back to one set here. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about um, 
about the cultures in here in Minnesota who saw uh, who saw constellations in the night sky and learn more about what they what they know about the night sky. Um, there's a fantastic group uh, called Native Sky Watchers um, that uh, run by Dr. Annette Lee, and they um, their mission part of their mission is to explore this knowledge of the sky through an indigenous lens. Um, they're based right here in Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Lee works uh, upstate. Um, and it's a fantastic group. Um, there are many different ways to see the night sky. Um, we're, we're used to looking, I, at least from my personal perspective, very used to looking at this Western constellation grouping and, and set of stars and ways of interpreting the sky. Um, but there is a lot more out there. Um, here at the Bell Museum, in fact, we are sitting where I am right now. Uh, if you come visit us as well, you'll be standing or sitting uh, on Dakota land. Um, Dakota had their own way of seeing the night sky separate from Western Ptolemy over in Egypt or the Ojibwe as well. Um, we also here at the Bell Museum uh, do uh, wave a mission to uh, any members of indig indigenous people, uh, indigenous tribes who, who wish to identify themselves. So um, please bear that in mind if, if you get a chance to, to visit the Bell Museum here. Uh, coming back to Orion, um, it was noted there the Maya were seeing uh, as seeing the bottom of part of Orion as, as this, they, they called it the primordial fire. Now, I'm not a Maya historian, so I'm, I'm not going to talk more about their particular beliefs and, and what they saw in the sky. But I want to point out one reason they, they might have seen it, which is what's lying below the belt of Orion. Coming below the belt of Orion, we have this beautiful deep sky object called M42, or the Great Orion Nebula. Um, it's very easy to spot. You can see it, in fact, with your own unaided eye under very dark skies as a fuzzy patch there. Binoculars, a telescope will also make it just as beautiful as you see right here. Um, it is one of the most beautiful objects in the entire sky. Um, it is an area, it is one of the closest and largest areas of stellar formation to the Earth. So what's happening here is the fires of thousands of new stars forming in just the past few tens of thousands of years. Um, the light they put out from these stars, not really from fire, but from fusion at their cores, the light from these stars is headed outwards and it's lighting up the gas and dust that, that surrounds them, which puts out more light that we get here on Earth. It's a remarkable area in the night sky. It's one of the top things to see in the winter sky. Um, it's visible in the early evening throughout most of the evening. Um, in fact, it is visible uh, until about three or four o'clock in the morning. Um, in uh, Greek mythology, Orion here was a great hunter. And during one of his um, escapades, let's call it, um, he uh, annoyed the goddess Artemis. Um, he annoyed her by saying that he was going to stomp out all, light, all animal life here on Earth. He was going to hunt all the animals. And Artemis sent a giant scorpion to sting him. Um, and Orion and the scorpion, Scorpius, were locked in battle. Um, it finally ended when Orion stepped and squished Scorpius, but not before Scorpius got his stinger into Orion, and they both perished. The gods decide to honor them by putting them up in the sky, but putting them on opposite sides of the sky. So as Orion sets in the sky, as the night goes along and he starts to set over to the west, uh, this, is when, uh, this is when the constellation of Scorpius will start to rise over in the east. Um, and there's Fugus. Uh, Scorpius should be somewhere down over here. Um, so we see Scorpius just rising over there to the east as Orion sets in the west. Um, for you parents out here, you may recognize this particular form of uh, dealing with quarreling children. Uh, coming back to Orion, though, looking around Orion uh, and coming back to, uh, we're here still at about 7.30. Um, if we're looking at Orion in the sky, uh, there's a lot more around him. His belt here serves as a great guide to finding things in the sky. If you come down from the belt, almost straight, uh, pretty much just forming a straight line down from it, uh, you'll run into the bright star called Sirius. Right over here, Sirius, the dog star, part of the constellation of Canis Major, or the larger dog. Uh, the Going back up from the belt as well, which we'll need to remove that particular drawing. Coming back up from the belt of Orion, zoom in a bit more here. Uh, the belt here also points upwards. Oops, I try to draw a straight line there. Draw points upwards to the red star Aldebaran. So another red star, kind of similar to Antares, which we saw very early in the morning, uh, early in our time today. Antares, though, makes up the head of Taurus, or the bull. 
And Taurus and Orion here are two more constellations locked in battle in the sky. And uh, there they are. We've got a few more constellations as well. Uh, locked in battle in the sky. Um, in different stories, Taurus here is, uh, in Greek mythology at least, is Zeus uh, turned into a bull and he's protecting the seven daughters of Atlas from Orion, the very amorous Orion. Uh, we see those seven daughters as the seven sisters or the Pleiades um, riding on the back of the bull here. Now, looking in the sky, I personally do not see seven stars there. Um, I, however, have somewhat pretty light polluted skies. Um, I usually see something more like five stars, maybe maybe five on a good night, maybe something more like four. If nah, complain about light pollution there. If you get binoculars though, you can start to pick out uh, some of the thousands of stars that make up this cluster. Um, with long exposure photographs, you could pick out the haze surrounding these stars. This is a, a part of the gas and dust of the Milky Way itself that these stars are moving through. Um, so as the light from the stars is emitted, it, it balances off these dust grains and that uh, reflects the blue wavelengths and, and makes it beautiful to see in the sky. Again, with, with long exposure photographs, I, I wouldn't expect to see that with the unaided eye. Um, looking around again from Orion, there was Sirius down there. Um, up from Taurus though, actually, or I, actually, no, let me come back to Orion. Um, Orion is his belt, this is the most famous part of it. But if you also go down to the bottom star here, Rigel, and you draw a line up through the belts, up through the star, red, reddish star Betelgeuse, um, that will point you uh, to a group of two stars. Make sure I can see all of them here. Um, it'll point you to two stars, go past here, uh, right over here, about two hand lengths away, here and here. These two stars are known as Castor and Pollux, and they make up the two brightest stars of the constellation of Gemini, or the Twins. Uh, Gemini is filled with, uh, filled with bright stars. So the, the stars that I connect, that were connected together here are very bright, very easy to see. Um, I often look for Gemini, not quite in this complexity. I look for something more like a simple rectangle there in the sky. Um, there's about, there's a few stars here that can all be connected together to form this very simple shape. And that stands out pretty clearly to me in the sky. Um, you might be able to see the arms of the twins stretching out as well. Um, coming down from Gemini, um, we also have, uh, from the head of Gemini at least, we can also make a bit of an angle downwards to a lonely star called Procyon. Procyon, which is part of this very complex constellation known as Canis Minor, or the smaller dog. For those looking there, yep, that's a hard one to imagine. Uh, We have the big dog, we have the smaller dog, we have Taurus, just to round it out, coming back above uh, the horns of Taurus. If we went from the belt to find the eye of Taurus, then we can go to the two stars here at the horn, uh, horns and travel upwards from here till we find this very bright star, um, which we actually found a little bit earlier, actually the very beginning, as we were tracking down a comet, this bright star over here is Capella. Um, which is part of the constellation of Auriga or Origa, the charioteer. Um, uh, the, the sort of dented shape, this boxy shape of this constellation is meant to represent a chariot wheel in Greek mythology to honor the first person to invent the, the chariot wheel. Um, now looking at our sky here, there is so much more going on. Um, this area of the night sky in particular, because it lies right along the path of the Milky Way galaxy, this hazy band you can sort of see hopefully right in, in front of the screen in front of you on the screen there this area of the night sky is very dense with deep sky objects in particular this is a great area of the sky to find open clusters of stars these are clusters of stars like the pleiades like the seven sisters they're groups of tens hundreds thousands of stars they're born fairly recently um, groups like the pleiades are about 65 million just 65 million years old um, some of these clusters are even younger, just a few millions of years old to the slightly older ones, hundreds of millions of years old. Um, they can be uh, seen with a pair of binoculars um, in, in a large number of cases because you've got a bunch of stars, so they're pretty bright. They can also be seen uh, just as easily or more easily, I should say, with a telescope. Um, so it, looking just up here, I'll zoom in on our, on our Riga here. 
Um, looking in this area of the sky, we've got groups like the starfish cluster uh, up, up over to our left here, um, going down to the pinwheel cluster as well. One great thing about open clusters of stars is that really looking at the names, they, they tend to be pretty imaginative names, but uh, spending enough time with them drawing these groups of stars, you might actually be able to pick out where they get that name from, the pinwheel cluster. You might be able to see some of this pinwheel shape there in the stars. Um, just here on your screen, but again, hopefully, I should say, hopefully as you go outside yourself and look for these objects. Looking at our time though, uh, I've, I've gone a little over what we had for our listed time here. So I wanna pause um, and see if we, uh, one of my colleagues in the back there was keeping an eye on Facebook, see if we had any questions that came up along the way, anything I wanted to answer, uh, anything that was confusing, should talk more about. Yeah, no questions today. All right, so that is, oh, that is all right. We, uh, no questions today, that is fine. Um, there is a lot more to see in the sky. I hope you all get a chance to explore it yourselves. Um, if you have questions, if you're watching this in the future, um, I hope those flying cars have finally arrived. And if you do more, if you have more questions as you watch this, please feel free to put them in the Facebook chat there. Um, we will we'll try our best. We'll keep an eye on that and try our best to answer um, as the month goes along. Uh, but with that, um, I want to thank you all so much for tuning in um, wh whenever, wherever you are watching this. Um, if you're here in the Twin Cities uh, right now, it is a very cloudy, snowy day. Um, so wherever you are, though, I hope you are staying safe and staying warm. And uh, thanks again and have a great rest of your day and happy new year, everyone.